Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. Happy to see you today. Happy Thursday. And I've got a really great show lined up for you today. I'm really very excited. Um, today, we are going to talk with Eleni from Women's Nutrition Clinic. And um, today, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, actually a clinical topic that I think you're going to be really interested in, and that is PCOS. All right. So um, Eleni is really an expert in this in this particular area. So today is all about understanding your clients with PCOS. And um, we'll be talking specifically about, <clears throat> you know, just PCOS and must know information as a health professional. And really specifically, we're going to be delving into more of the functional and integrative approach to helping your clients with PCOS. So I think you are going to find it fascinating, especially because it is, it's a very complex um, disease state, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so Eleni, welcome. Really so happy to have you here with me today. It's always so much fun to reconnect with you. And yeah. thrilled to see you, your success. Um, so welcome. Um, let's kick things off. Uh, I'd love just to hear a little bit about your backstory. You know, what led you to down this path in uh, in specializing with uh, you know in helping women with PCOS. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for just having me here. Like, it's so great to reconnect. You've really supported me throughout the years um, and helping me help more women as well. So I appreciate that. Yeah, awesome. um, so when it comes to PCOS, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, the reason I'm really passionate about it is because I had personally struggled with it years ago before it got um, a little, I won't say it's mainstream, but you can find more resources on it now. I think there are more dietitians and um, health providers individualizing in it. However, I was really struggling. So I was at the doctor's office. I was put on five different medications at one point. I felt awful. Um, mental health, physical health was really declining. And um, it felt really odd to me that growing up in a fairly healthy household, fairly holistic, that I was being given only medications uh, and not really getting to the root cause. So at that point, I was also early on in my college career to be a dietitian. So kind of ironic, I was going through this health crisis while also furthering my education and a health career. But I was able to use that to understand that the body is complex. There's more we can do than just medication. Sometimes medications obviously can be appropriate um, for disease states. And so throughout uh, quite a long journey, I was able to eventually reverse my PCOS, manage a lot of the symptoms, keep my body out of an inflamed state. And it only felt natural to me that once I became a dietitian, exposed to functional integrative healthcare, um, to specialize in this because I do believe I can come from a very empathetic place and oh. understand what women are going through, especially on an emotional <laughs> level. I get it. And having actually the scientific background and the education, I'm not just a coach saying do exactly what I did to fix my body. I'm coming with a full um, set of tools, clinical tools as well. Mm -hmm. So that's about the journey and why women nutrition clinic exists and i also just work with women that want to feel better and um enjoy their day-to-day -day life a little bit more so it's really fun uh what i get to do every day yeah that's amazing yeah and it, isn't it interesting how you know many of us start on a path and yeah. it's based on our life experience mm -hmm. um, quite often that uh, really has a huge influence on um, the areas that we decide to delve into, certainly in your case, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, all right, so you were diagnosed with PCOS um, while you were in school and mm -hmm. um, really the only solution was, here you go, here's you five prescriptions. And it was Thing. Yeah, metformin, yeah. spironolactone, birth oh control, gosh. thyroid medication, anxiety medication. It was everything was just off, and the medication made things worse for me in my situation. So right. it, was, it was crazy time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, you know, for our audience, let's talk a little bit about you know what what exactly is it? It's very complex. Um, 
why don't you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the definition and what it looks like in, in clinical practice? Yeah, yeah. So um, as I will refer to it as PCOS, but again, it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, but not every female presents with ovarian cysts. However, to be diagnosed with PCOS, you do have to meet two out of the three diagnostic criteria. So this can be androgen excess, this can be the polycystic ovaries, or this can be ovulatory dysfunction. So changes in the menstrual cycle um, specifically. And it is the most common endocrine disorder among women of childbearing years. It's often confused as a reproductive disorder because a lot of women find out about it um, through infertility, uh, but it's not just a reproductive issue. Okay. What's really fascinating about PCOS is there is a genetic component. And I do believe that we're seeing um, a rise in PCOS. And that's why I really want to share about it today because numbers yeah. are going up. And it's because genes are being turned on. It's a very uh, complex pathway. We're not exactly sure just yet, but we can look at our environment as a big driver. Right? So that whole um, topic of epigenetics, why are these genes getting turned on in these women? So we can have this predisposition. It doesn't mean you're destined for PCOS. If your mother has PCOS, it doesn't mean you're going to have it. Um, but if any female or patient has PCOS, it is important to look at, hey, is it did your mom have PCOS? Did an aunt have it? Um, did they have a metabolic condition that triggered it? So I think that's really fascinating that there is this oh, it uh, is. underlying and component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of this does go back to genetics. Oh, yeah. yeah. And epigenetics in particular, right? Like which, uh, which of those genes are being expressed um, more prominently than others. Um, yeah, super interesting. So it's not like there's one gene that they've identified, right? It's it's mm -hmm. more like a compilation of um, how different um, genes um, interact, I would I would think, right? And, and women with PCOS can actually have different root causes. So this is where we can get into more of like the integrative or functional approach. So what is that trigger, right? What's that? I always picture a light switch to me. So if that gene gets turned on, like who's turning on the light? Mm -hmm. um, so there's these various root causes. So I'll go through a few of them. Um, yeah. One is inflammation, right? So if we live in an inflammatory environment or we have inflammation in our body, if we have a chronic gut issue, if we have another mm -hmm. autoimmune condition, um, if there's something that keeps bombarding our system, that can help turn that switch on. Insulin resistant. Um, we see a lot of women with insulin resistance, but we don't. that's, um, I would say, the more like typical PCOS that a lot of providers might be used to seeing, but that's not necessarily for everybody. So what's contributing to that? It could be a high carbohydrate diet or the standard American diet, the SAD diet, right? That's contributing to that insulin resistance, turning that on. Um, some sort of adrenal related issue. So stress. Um, this is where we see a lot of women with lean PCOS. So a lot of women that aren't overweight, they're getting the diagnosis. They don't have that insulin resistant state. Well, are their systems just overloaded? Are they super stressed? Are they the modern day female, right? Working really hard, maybe a mom, not getting that self-care time in and even birth control. So women that had completely normal cycles prior, their hormones were regulated and then they were on the pill, they're getting off of it. Um, and that could have triggered something because birth control can trigger changes in blood sugar and even insulin states. So hope that makes sense. Um, it does. Kind of it, it, I would imagine that um, especially with women <clears throat> that don't have a weight issue, yeah. I'm wondering like how, how is it not until they try to become pregnant? Do you, like, what is the trigger for the diagnosis? Right. So what I've seen um, is that so women, um, you know, fairly healthy weight, fairly, you know, good health history. And, and then they say, hey, I've been on the pill 10 to 15 years and uh, now I'm off of it. I'm trying to get pregnant. It's not working. I've gained a little bit of weight at this point. It's just kind of stubborn. So that can definitely be a trigger um, as more women are on the pill. There's no shame about that at all. We just have to know that it completely shuts down that connection, right? Between our brain to our reproductive system. The pill can disrupt the gut microbiome. So if you have this genetic predisposition, something like that can trigger it. 
women with PCOS are more susceptible to gut dysbiosis too, which I also find fascinating. So I think everything can kind of work together. So I do see that quite a bit, but then I also see women who have said, hey, my cycles have always been irregular. I've always um, been a little overweight. And then after years of not really addressing the core, it just kind of explodes and then the symptoms get worse too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So if I'm just a, you know, a lay person, how, like when would I start to suspect PCOS you know, in terms of, yeah, in terms of um, the, the most common symptoms, like what would trigger me to go um, to my doctor? Yeah. So some of the most common symptoms we see with PCOS, um, waking can be one, but the, like yep. I said, it's not for everybody. Um, but excess hair growth in unwanted places. You know, uh, some women of certain backgrounds, I'm Greek and Italian, like you might have a little hair, but it's pretty obvious. Like if there's excess hair growth, if you're having to shave, pluck, wax, it's growing back worse, especially in hormonal areas of the body, like the jawline, above the lip, the chest, the back. These are areas that a lot of women complain of that excess hair growth. This is because of that high um, androgen state, the higher testosterone levels. Acne, um, adult acne can be a big sign if somebody has PCOS, hair loss, um, gut issues, if there's some sort of inflammatory marker that's presenting on labs, blood sugar dysregulation, mm -hmm. insulin dysregulation. So these are like a few. So it kind of, it's more about like some of the main symptoms. Um, but then if there's even some standard labs that somebody has drawn, especially like blood sugar and insulin or testosterone, that's a nice starting point too. Okay. Okay. So as a health professional, we've got lots of health pros uh, watching today. Lots of, I mean, big variety of different types of health professionals. Why would you say, why is it important? Um, you know, let's say someone doesn't necessarily specialize in PCOS. Why is it important um, to have a really good knowledge base around identifying uh, clients with PCOS and just kind of having a handle on what to do about it. Yeah, I think this is really important and why I was excited to share, because like I said, the numbers are on the rise, like infertility mm -hmm. numbers, um, metabolic sort of imbalances. And it's important because it can really support a, a female in truly managing these symptoms. It can take effort, but these symptoms can be managed versus somebody having to struggle, be on medications, deal with symptoms, infertility, anxiety longer term. So I think as a clinician, just looking for, you know, when you're speaking to your client, like, are their menstrual cycles irregular? If that's appropriate in their health history to ask if they've been irregular for how long do they notice excess hair growth in unwanted places? Are they dealing with acne, hair loss? Is there, have they tried every diet, but they can't lose weight? Those are like telltale signs um, or questions you can ask about um, if and when appropriate to help a female get the appropriate care. Because again, these symptoms can be managed long-term. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be um, like a victim to your PCOS because it's it's incredibly debilitating physically and emotionally for women. And I think if we can work together and give the women just a little bit of relief, mm -hmm. um, it goes a long way for the quality of their life. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I wanna welcome Karen. Hey, Karen, happy to have you today. So Karen's got a few or a couple questions. So do you find women without a weight slash metabolic issue, um, do they tend to be underdiagnosed? Mm, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I've actually find both. I find them underdiagnosed because, well, you don't fit that standard PCOS, you know, picture. Right. And after I say, what's going on? Um, find out about their lifestyle. Are they like type A, you know, like I said, like modern female type A, can you do a little bit of testing where you're looking at um, how their adrenal cortisol is functioning? Can you look at their micronutrients? Um, so I do find that they're underdiagnosed, but I also find that um, providers are giving a lot of women the diagnosis of PCOS mm -hmm. when really it's like, are you just overstressed? And do we need to work on some sort of um, balance there? Is your blood sugar just slightly dysregulated? So I hope that answers her question. Um, I do find underdiagnosis, but I, I often find almost like using the label a little bit too much to the point where we're totally ignoring the person and we're just giving them this stamp. And then they get a lot of fear around that and say, you know, well, what's actually going on? <laughs> um, you don't have a metabolic issue, but what is your root cause? Overlooking the root cause. Okay. And then um, what are the questions we should have 
on our intake forms to help, yeah, to, to flag PCOS. Yeah, really helpful. Um, I like this question. So I would ask a lot about the symptoms. That's a great starting point. And if they answer yes to them, then you can do a little bit more um, testing if you feel comfortable, just some standard blood tests. But excess hair growth, you can ask about that on the face, the back, the chat. You could say excess hair growth. Where are you seeing it? If they're presenting in hormonal areas, do they experience adult acne? Um, are they having regular or irregular menstrual cycles? Do they notice hair loss? Um, are they noticing high amounts of stress? Mm. Those are some good um, questions to ask. Do they experience excessive hunger? Between oh. What is their fullness cues like? That's another um, player in PCOS. As well. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. What about the anxiety piece? Mm, um, yes. Yeah, tell me a little bit, of, like, where does that fit in? And I guess what's the, the, the reasoning behind an increase in anxiety? Yeah, I love that. So women with PCOS can experience more anxiety or depression for a few different reasons. Mm -hmm. Some could be because of the hormone imbalance, so the swings in blood sugar, the higher testosterone. It can make you actually a little bit more moody and cranky. Okay. Um, but then we have to actually look at, um, you know, the, the female as a whole, all the females watching, I want you to think about it. Like what would happen if your hair started falling out and you started getting a bald spot around the crown of your head? Oh. What happened if you started growing hair on your face or you had acne and you had no idea why it was happening or you had no idea how to fix it and you're you're hiding shaving your face behind your husband's back i mean these are things that these women deal with so um this part of the mental health piece of pcos can absolutely be because of the symptoms um and there's a lot of pressure around women to be on diets with pcos to cut carbs and that can cause a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. and women with pcos are even more likely to have disordered eating patterns so oh, gosh. Um, i'm really happy that we're talking about this because yes. something that i think is unique about my approach with pcos with patients is um, yeah, I'm not a therapist, but I, I keep in mind their emotional health and I make sure that's being taken care of because, because the disorder can be really, um, really, really challenging if you look at it that way. They're getting hit from all Every angles, angle. even yeah. disordered eating, which completely yeah. makes sense. So, oh my gosh, it, I mean, really, I can't really think, uh, I mean, maybe there are more complicated disorders, but this has to be right up there yeah. in terms of kind of unfortunately just having such um a wide range of really intense symptoms hey kim um, welcome um so kim great question do you um so eleni do you use any dutch tests do you use the dutch test yeah yeah um especially when it feels yeah absolutely when it feels appropriate because you're able to look at the trends in cortisol you're able to look at the testosterone, the metabolites, um, you're able to look at if they were, especially on birth control and they got off of it and they've been off of it for at least a couple months, you can see some of the trends in their hormones. So it can absolutely be helpful um, if you have access to that. And if people don't have access to that, just some standard blood labs can still go a long way. Vitamin D, their A1C, their fasting insulin, their iron stores, running a full thyroid panel. I can't stress that enough because women with PCOS, oh are more likely to have some sort of thyroid condition or hypothyroidism. So just want to throw that in there while we talk about test, testing as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about um, what are some of the, I guess, myths or big mistakes that, that are kind of impeding this whole treatment process for women struggling with PCOS? Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest myths is that birth control regulates the cycle. So that's a common treatment approach to say, oh, your period's uh, irregular because of PCOS. Just take birth control until you want to get pregnant and come back. Again, that completely shuts down the communication between your different body systems. It doesn't regulate the cycle. It gives you a fake bleed. So, um, you know, I think this could be more for like the client to understand, but if your client's on birth control for PCOS, just be receptive and say, Hey, you know, what are you, what else might, are you doing? Are you working on your nutrition, your lifestyle? Because we really want to address this from a root, not cover up the symptoms. Um, another big myth is that women with PCOS can't get pregnant. Um, women with PCOS can absolutely get pregnant. I see it all the time in my practice. And it's, I think one of the most rewarding things to see is if somebody is really purposeful about motherhood, they're able to achieve that. So, when you address the symptoms, you get to the root cause, you get an individual ovulating, get symptoms under control, 
pregnancy can definitely happen. Um, so this kind of goes along with like symptoms. People believe they can never reverse their PCOS symptoms. Like they're locked into that for the rest of their life. And that's not true. Again, there's this genetic component. So yeah, a client or female will always have to take care of themselves. Um, but we can usually manage these symptoms really well. We don't have to be victim to them um, any longer. And one last uh, myth I want to share is uh, you have to lose weight to balance PCOS. Not necessarily true because PCOS exists. Um, weight loss isn't always um, what's most important. So look at the person as an individual, not just PCOS as a syndrome. Oh, interesting. Okay. So in your treatment process then, um, do you tend to use supplements as well? Yeah, I'm a big fan of supplements. Um, you know, it, it totally in moderation depending on the person, but if somebody is insulin resistant, mm -hmm. inositol is wonderful. The blend of okay. micro and D Cairo can be a nice alternative, especially mm -hmm. if females struggle with gut issues due to metformin. This is really common. Mm -hmm. um, so something for practitioners to know, and it's also not going to deplete different vitamins like metformin does. So I love inositol when appropriate. I okay. love adaptogens when appropriate. If one of the root causes is this, you know, cortisol, high stress, just depleted okay. state. Um, and then if we want to do a little further support, if we're looking at the Dutch and the hormones, there's some nice herbs for that. Um, and again, some just standard labs, run their iron, run their vitamin D. Everybody I see in my clinic is vitamin D deficient. Okay. Um, and, and maybe a little bit of thyroid support if appropriate. Uh, so yeah, lots of, we could, could go on about that. Gut support, probiotics. PCOS is a total body syndrome. That's what we need to understand. We can't That's isolate right. the reproductive system. We can't just look at insulin. We've got to look at thyroid, other markers, hormones. And then from there, um, supplements can be really supportive, especially if females don't feel good about the prescriptions they've been provided. But I'll bet like insomnia is a real big problem too, right? Yeah. Guessing. Yep. yep. Based on everything I'm hearing. Yeah. And what happens when you sleep, you heal, right? So sleep support is a big one. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, let's see. Oh, actually, good. A really good question. So uh -huh. what diet plan or eating pattern do you um, do you use to support clients with PCOS? Oh, and that a great question about soy. Uh -huh. The million dollar question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for starters, you know, in terms of nutrition support, my philosophy that I use in my clinic is whole, real, organic, fresh, seasonal when we can. And I do take a really balanced approach. So I do tell clients, you know, focus on protein at every meal, not too much, because too much protein can impact blood sugar too mm -hmm. in a negative way. Um, really focus on adding in good fiber, good healthy fats. And I do advise to actually add a little bit of high quality carbohydrates, about a half a cup at lunch and dinner. That's pretty specific, but for blood sugar, insulin regulation, you know, we want to keep carbs a little bit lower in the morning, but carbs aren't evil. And this is important for the mental state of your clients, because remember, but put yourself in their shoes. If they've had weight gain or they're trying to balance their blood sugar and they're being told don't eat carbs and then they're being told to continue doing that, it's really hard for these women um, or for what I see clinically. So, so balance, I find, is the best. Some examples of high quality carbs that I like to use are sweet potato lentils, um, you know, any of your winter squash. I even educate clients about seasonal fruit. You know, some of the lower glycemic fruit is better, but if they want to have a cup of watermelon, it's like, just eat the watermelon with your protein. So pairing protein, fat, and fiber are essential. And whenever a client is having a carbohydrate, always make sure they're having a little protein or fat with it as well. So that's sort of like the plan or approach that I use. I do emphasize three meals a day. Um, intermittent fasting, we have to be careful because these women's systems can get stressed out really easily. Oh. Too much fasting. If they have some hypothyroidism, if they're depleted, if they're stressed, fasting can stress the body out more. So it's a fine, a fine balance. Um, I kind of like 12, 14 hours from dinner to breakfast and then three meals a day and maybe a snack if appropriate. So I hope, hope that's helpful in terms of eating pattern. Um, I find soy based on like what I've seen, a little bit of high quality, organic, non-GMO soy mm -hmm. is okay. Um, the reason being is because we're not seeing, you know, this crazy impact on estrogen, but what is pretty interesting is that um, women who, uh, like Asian women, for example, from descent, have been eating soy for a long time, right? And so the studies mm -hmm. are showing that 
when women are eating the soy, but they have this genetic like predisposition for it, they tend to do better. So in the Western world, what I say is, you know, have a little bit of it, but mm -hmm. don't overdo it. So I hope that makes sense. I think soy is okay, but there is definitely this genetic component or ancestral mm -hmm. component that we want to keep in mind with soy. But I think with honestly any any food. So I try to keep, um, you know, I try to keep balance, yeah, people variety, um, but not restriction too. And then um, um, I don't know. Did you talk a little bit about the GMO based soy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, so, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So totally like non-GMO. I really try to emphasize organic um, when okay. possible. Avoid pesticides because that can all be toxins or you know inflammation that can yeah. totally impact um, obviously your hormones. And how else could people be getting toxic exposure through plastics, non-toxic mm -hmm. cookware? So right. it's part of the eating plan. Right. We have to talk so, about. Yeah. What do you store your food in? How are you cooking your food? If they can't afford organic. Um, you know, can they wash their vegetables really well? So trying trying to really avoid toxic exposure too is a big part of the eating plan. Okay. All right. We got a comment here. Yeah. Validation of the Dutch test. Great. Um, yeah. I'd love to just spend a few minutes kind of changing gears a little bit. Um, just talking about your practice. Yeah. Um, it's, if you don't mind, it's always super fun just to get an update on, you know, just, um, how just from a practice building standpoint, um, I know you're seeing private clients. Tell us a little bit about like the different services you're offering. Yeah. Including, um, I know you have a course as well that mm -hmm. probably people um, here are going to want to learn a little bit more about. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, I have individual uh, clients. So they go through usually minimum of like a three month program. That okay. way we're really moving through all of, the pillars that I believe to be essential to support them in managing PCOS, that can include okay. testing. Um, I also have group programs. I have small group PCOS programs. I find groups really empowering because these women feel so alone in their symptoms. And right. just to be together in a group and to converse and to learn together, um, it's really, really beautiful to see and gotten good feedback about that. So we have some group coaching um, right. and courses. So the, the point of the PCOS course that I have is to really fill in the gaps that I saw in the healthcare system for PCOS, both personally, um, but also professionally. So it's to give the foundational information. Foundationally, what should these women be doing for their nutrition, for their lifestyle, for their gut health? What lab tests should they be absolutely looking at that they can advocate for when they go to their doctor? Um, so it's a really nice blend. I have a special guest that offers a PCOS workout. We do some meditations on there. So it's really interactive course, they get some nice handouts. Um, and it's honestly something that practitioners can do. It's, uh, you know, a four week course, it's not the modules aren't super long. And it's actually a way for you to further support your clients too. So so that's a course um, that I offer as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll put the link for Eleni's course in the in the chat. Hopefully, you guys will be able to see that. Um, so it's, uh, www.womensnutritionclinic.com. So that's her website, womensnutritionclinic.com forward slash online dash course. Or is it courses? Courses. Courses. Yeah. We have one other, one other fun course in there on uh, okay. and sex drive with a sex therapist, because a lot of women okay. with hormone issues and PCOS can struggle with low libido. So if that interests you, that's a really fun <laughs> interactive course as well. Okay. Let me um, actually, so let me create a, um, I'll put this on the screen. There we go. So women's hey. nutrition clinic.com forward slash online dash courses. So, well, one thing that I really love to hear is that um, you've been successful in creating multiple streams of income, one of my very favorite topics, right? And, um, you know, you've created some leveraged offers, including, um, you know, the, the group programs, which, you know, is certainly a win-win all the way around, right? It helps leverage your time um, and certainly the, your clients and patients um, you know, they feel really well supported being around not only you as their practitioner, but also other women in the group that are experiencing, 
you know, similar challenges in their lives as a result of their of their PCOS diagnosis, which is so great. I love that. Yeah, it's um, you know, just speaking off of that, as providers, I think we all we all want to help, right? But it's so easy to get burnt out. Um, yeah. So it's really rewarding to say this feels purposeful. I'm I'm reaching more people. Like we need to address this. Um, <laughs> but not killing myself in the process. So it's, yeah, it's really fun. Right. And the thing that I hear day after day in the work that I do is, oh my gosh, like when, when my clients are able to do what you've done um, and, and successfully offer a group experience for their clients, there, it's just like such a relief. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, like you can say you instead of repeating things like eight times a day or, you know, six times a day, it's just such a relief to be able to um, kind of condense that right into, um, you know, fewer, uh, fewer touch points in your day. And, and you know what? I think what people need, I think the really in-depth testing, it's so powerful but the foundations, like what got us here in the first place? People weren't probably doing some foundational stuff, at least for my audience. A lot of it's like foundation, nutrition, lifestyle. And so it is, it's so powerful to have groups when you can and say, wow, I can review a lot of these foundational pieces and people are saying tremendous change. And so I like that you brought that up. It's like, yeah, you can enjoy yourself. You can um, not have to repeat yourself a bunch during the day and they yeah. still get the message, the important message. Right, yeah. Well. Maybe you can offer um, a couple of tips um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, because I know most people, most uh, health professionals that I talk to dream of being successful, you know, not only having programs and packages like you're doing, like the three month experience, moving away from the one on one sessions, mm -hmm. but also um, building out what I call the profit pyramid and successfully being able to fill your groups. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's being really targeted with who you want the group to be for because yeah. the more specific, right, the more you can get that person to come. And, you know, allowing that group to be the most basic foundational thing. I think as practitioners, we want to, sometimes we want to give like every little thing, right? Sure. We want to give the information, but that can be overwhelming to people. So if you say, hey, I have this group offering a certs X day, we're going through the foundation through nutrition lifestyle, like give them a nice little outline yeah. and, and make the group robust. So for example, I also give people um, a version of the online course. So little modules that they can do between, I give them mm -hmm. access to log their food. So I think a way to make the course or sorry, the group really successful is um, being specific about what you want to offer, but also have add-ons. And these add-ons, um, they're usually not going to kill you in the process. I don't mind giving a little extra, you know, uh, recipes or giving that extra course. It was fairly easy to put that together. Um, yeah. and, and just making the timing right. So, you know, on my website, mm -hmm. when I have a group that's about to start, it's very targeted. Like the marketing is right. very targeted, like this group, this start date, schedule the discovery call. Um, and I find actually scheduling discovery calls to be one of the most beneficial ways to get people in the group because okay. people don't know what they don't need sometimes. And you might think somebody's calling for an individual, um, but it's also a great way to discuss your program. And I feel like I learned that from you is like getting on the getting on the phone with people can be powerful. So I hope it, that made sense or was helpful. It does. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I do think in terms of moving people into a group, I it still is one of my favorite strategies to have a conversation with them. Yeah. And that really, it really helps them to get to know you better as, as the practitioner. And also um, it just feels more personalized for them. Yeah. And they really see the value in moving yeah. forward. Um, because it's, you know, let's be honest, it's not, it's depending on the price point, of course, but if it's, you know, um, even a, if it's a higher price point, I would say, especially, it's important to have a conversation because people just don't tend to click the buy button um, for, you know, for those higher end offers because they just are like, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll, you know, maybe another time. Right. So yeah. I think that's a really, really important strategy there. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to mention to everybody, uh, make sure that you sign up for my, I actually have a brand new, 
and I'm super excited about this, guys. It is going to really be awesome. Very robust. If you think multiple streams of income was full, wait until you see this new training. Um, so it's called Sales Funnel Secrets for Health Pros. And I'm going to be teaching you how to create passive and leverage offers in your practice. All right. So I have the URL on the screen, lesliebytel.com forward slash funnel dash challenge. All right. So mark your calendars so that you're able to show up live May 3rd, 4th, and 5th at 7 p.m. Central. So we're going to do it in the evening again. Um, seemed to work out well last time. So again, that URL, lesliebytel.com forward slash funnel dash challenge. Um, and actually, if you have a mo another minute or so, we we got a couple more questions um, that I think are really good. Um, thoughts on whole food, plant-based versus animal? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, love, I'm glad that you brought this up because I'd even mention it. So I, I do find with PCOS that women do really well with a little bit of animal protein. I just think from like a blood sugar perspective, even if the client doesn't have insulin resistance, mm -hmm. still balancing that blood sugar is really key and essential. Um, and if somebody chooses to do whole food plant-based really look at their ferritin stores make sure they're on some good supplementation um mm -hmm. and it's really hard to keep a whole foods diet lower in carbs or a healthy amount of carbs i find people tend to really overdo the carbs so you know an animal protein or animal foods it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be aggressive it can be you know a little bit of eggs a little bit of fish you could mm -hmm. do a little bit of like collagen powder if somebody doesn't want to eat you know red meat and steak every day so um I think it's a balance, but I do find animal foods are really, really um, beneficial for this sort of population. Okay, great. Ooh, and I love this question too. So what about coaching versus MNT? Really great question. Um, and then lab tests would, in interpretation, lab tests uh, would involve interpretation via MNT. I think that that part's a question too. So what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, this is a, another great question. Um, so in individual programs, um, I, I kind of blend the two and I say this to clients. I say, you know, yeah. what, I'm here to be a coach to support you and, and ask you questions and help you work through um, like patterns that haven't been serving you in terms of nutrition, lifestyle, because these women have a very complex relationship with food. So we want to understand the barriers, what's keeping them stuck, et cetera. Um, but the MNT is really essential, right? Looking at labs, seeing where each individual is. So I find it's actually a blend that works the best. Okay. But a lot of the foundational information can be very coaching based. Like that's what I do in the course. It's, it's um, the foundations that these women need to know. And then if they want to do a little bit labs, they can do that. So I think a blend is best, but um, coaching is still a great start to at least get yeah. the education out there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Definitely um, kind of a different approach, right? In terms yeah. of coaching versus MNT. Um, and I love what you said about blending the two. Um, yeah. And, you know, I can attest to that myself because that's exactly what what I used to do uh, when I had my nutrition practice is really combining the two approaches. Yeah. And I personally, I think that works really well. Because they've been told, you know, don't eat this or just eat this or eat this amount of carbs per day. Mm -hmm. They need like they need the support. And I think coaching is a really yeah. powerful piece to getting the message across and making sure it sticks. And so, yeah, I think the blend um, is really supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at least from my perspective, coaching is more about aligning with the client and yeah. um, versus MNT is a little bit more, the orientation is more about, you know, you being the expert, right? Right. Right. So it, it's super interesting how um, how those approaches are different and um, yes. especially how we can blend them into a really, I think, effective approach. Yeah. So, all right. Well, as we start to wrap up, um, any kind of final words of wisdom that you'd like to share, Lenny? Just thank you for having me, allowing me to, you know, be here and be an advocate for women with PCOS. And I think just like 
that word of wisdom is if you can ever put yourself in that place, if somebody's talking to you about a symptom, if you suspect it's PCOS, um, and just listen to your client because they know their bodies best. And um, mm -hmm. this population often feels very unheard. So thank you for letting me speak up for them. And if you come across a client where you suspect, just hold space for them. It, I know it'll mean a lot. Okay, awesome. And guys, just a quick reminder to go visit Eleni on her website, womensnutritionclinic.com forward slash online dash courses. And one last reminder on my upcoming three-day live event, be sure to save your seat um, at lesliebytel.com forward slash funnel dash challenge. And uh, I can't wait to see you there. It's going to be great. All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. We're finally getting some sun here in the Midwest. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Looking forward to getting outside later this afternoon. Hopefully, wherever you are, you're going to enjoy some, some time outside. And um, all right, so look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great rest of your day, wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now.